And you know, the political news wasn't as terrible as I think some of us thought it might be. Um, but we spent a lot of time talking about the desperate states of the ocean. Um, and I don't want to talk about that. I, we all feel it, we all experience it. I don't want people to hit the road on that kind of way. So I'm not going to talk about that aspect of the future. Instead, I want to talk about a more diverse future. And I'm going to be deliberately vague about what I mean by a diverse, more diverse future. You'll see that. I read, on the advice of my ophthalmologist, an am amazing book over here this year by Ed Young called The Immense World. And I want to spend the last few minutes of this talk talking about the impact that that book has had on my life and I hope will have on your lives as well. So the goal of extending the diversity of perspectives in a more diverse future, I think, is to incorporate more diverse perspectives and value systems and cultures in the development of our research programs, the way we think about our science priorities, and also to expand and extend the development and implementation of policy to sustain biodiversity. Um, we don't all agree on, not every, maybe people in this room do, but I can tell you that the whole world doesn't agree on what we mean by sustainability or holds the same values we do about the value of biodiversity. And the core concept that I want to leave you with is called the concept of in-depth, and this is a concept that's the core of Ed Young's book. Literally, it means, Umwelt means outer world. Um, it can also be described as the world that other organisms perceive of their Umwelt. They're all different. It's the world as is experienced by a particular organism. In the upper left, we experience our world, even if we're using magnetism, for example, or even using a compass or satellites, you know, that they say are in the sky, but I don't think they're really there. <laughs> they just, you know, you get this GPS thing here and you think, yeah, you know, it's real, but maybe it's not. But we're highly visual. But lots of organisms use lots of different, their umwelt, the way they experience their worlds, are vastly different than the way we as humans experience our world. Whether it's echoes and eyes, we now know that oyster creatures can hear sound and orient towards sound. Seabirds, petrels, use a combination of magnetism, odor, and vision to locate widely distributed prey. Many fish, not many, but a few groups of fish use electricity. We know that lots of organisms use echoes, and we also know that lots of organisms use a combination of both magnetism and odor as part of their movement, their, the way they experience and interact with the human. So as a quick example, what we thought of these scenes maybe 50 or 100 years ago, and how we're victims of our own sensory, cultural, social, and experiential lives. The guy von Uchtel, who is the inventor of the concept of Umwelt, thought a bee actually sees, this is what he thought bees actually see, circa 1934. So if you look at the lower left panel, that's what people thought, humans thought bees see. And he actually edited that in the lower right panel into what he thought a bee's umwelt was. Not. If we just look at the visual system of a bee, the visible world or the invisible, the visible world that you have in the visible world of a bee that bee has, they overlap kind of. So if you look at those images of the same flower shown in the bottom three panels, a human being would only see that image in the bottom panel because that's the colors that intersect with our spectral perception. But a bee would see vastly different patterns on those flowers because of the differences in their spectral processing capacity. And it's not just vision in bees that differs from our own garden. They can actually detect electrical fields and they can visualize flowers that emanate different electrical fields and use them as cues for identifying pollen and nectar sources and suitable plants to pollen. And there's way, way more to being a bee. They use odors and chemicals, they use polarized light. They sense vibrations that particular kinds of flowers put out to identify that flower as a suitable pollen or nectar source and how much nectar is actually left available in that flower. It's been a huge mystery 
how a bee knows whether a flower is worth visiting or not. And it turns out whether there's enough nectar for it to bother for making the forage and stuff. They can sense how much nectar there is in a flower by the vibrations it produces. They use magnetism, they use electricity, and of course they use taste. <laughs> No one else has to be fearful. <laughs> and just as one example, a random example, Jay, <laughs> of our own, and this is not a quote from Jay, in fact. So just, this is just a great picture of Jay having a moment. Um, when we describe the sensory systems of dolphins and bats, we often say they use a form of sonar to see or sense their environment. But actually, we use a form of echolocation that we call sonar to listen and to see our environment. They, we didn't invent echolocation, they did. And yet we describe it as if they're copying us. And then, like Gary and many other, Gary Grimet, my blind colleague, many other humans actually echolocate when we're blind. Um, and they're superb echolocators. And they use the tapping of the cane or other auditory signals that are reflecting off of objects to map their environments. And it's really worth trying sometime to train yourself to do it at home. Um, and it's a real sort of le good lesson in how you can alter your own food body by training yourself to do it. All right, so. This is the slide you already saw. Umwelten in the sea. We know they're different. The physics of everything in water is different than anything. And our picture as marine scientists of Umwelten in the sea and changing the ways we see the sea, if you will, I think really began early in my own career with the discovery by people like me, Nicole, Steve Wainwright, Steve Vogel, Mark Denny, Tom Daniel, that and, and, and they're opening up the world of biomechanics and they're understanding that life at low Reynolds number and the viscosity and density of water fundamentally change the way organisms interact with virtually every aspect of the environment, whether it's locomotion, whether it's mating, whether it's detecting signals, communicating, everything. And without going into the details, you all know that given the high viscosity and the high viscosity of water, and we all know about the concepts of Reynolds number. Reynolds numbers are so deeply, fundamentally different in the ocean than in water than they are in here. There's this really cool paper last or a few years ago in um, Journal Plankton Research. There are shown in that middle left panel, there are copepods now that are flying copepods. So they transition from a life in water at very high Reynolds number, they propel themselves to the water surface to escape predators, and then they fold back everything and emerge from the water, and then all of a sudden, they go from life at low Reynolds number to life at high Reynolds number. Super cool. Okay, and then, you know, when I was a kid and learned to scuba dive when I was a young kid, we thought about the ocean as the silent world. These are the ads for the Louis Maul movie made about Jacques Cousteau's discovery and exploration of the scuba. And the movie was called Silent World. Was the world silent or were they just men not listening? <laughs> More comments. <laughs> we know the sea is full of sound, not just the Beach Boys sound, but fish making sounds, whales making sounds, snapping shrimp making sounds, the whole thing. And we ignored that. The sea is a world full of different movement from contact and flow, light and sight, chemistry and sense, electricity, sound, echoes, magnetism, touch and pain. We know now that at least some species of octopus actually experience pain. They don't just react, they experience sensory, a very analogous to the way we experience. And we also know that we felt like diversity in our cultures has a high level of intersectionality, which I think is super important to understand. This isn't a concept we made up 
understand the impacts of multiple spectra of diversity on human beings. This is true in the sensory world. So when elephants pick up ground signals in their ground vibrations in their feet, we know they communicate by ground vibrations. Typically, it's not hearing that's at work, it's sensory vibration. But those vibrations that they pick up through their feet get transmitted to the brain along auditory nerves, not other sensory nerves. And even more amazing still, in a paper about 10 years ago, even in humans, the sense of vibration sensation and touch and hearing are intimately connected. So for example, people with hearing impairments process vibrotactile or touch sensation in the auditory cortex of their brain. They hear things that they touch. And so I think that's a really amazing way to think about the way that our sensory senses really happen here, not just in terms of the input devices. That puts a lot of responsibility there and not there. And then culture diversity and missing room development. What are we missing in the way we think organisms live in the sea and how they experience their environments? This is a quote from Luther Standing Bear, who was the leader of the Ogwala Nation um, from 1868 until he died in 1939. And he's describing uh, the, Logala, the, the, the Lakota Sioux. They love the earth and all things of the earth, the attachment growing with age, and so on. The gist of this message is that members of the tribe sat on the ground to talk with each other, not because they didn't know how to use chairs, but because when they sat on the ground, they could feel the vibrations of the ground and know whether there were predators near, where there were fellow members of their tribe there, what was there. They had a whole different set of umvek that they could process and use in their lives. And yet, hang on just a second. Is it, is it okay? My wife just texted me and asked me how my talk's going. What should I say? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do it. Should I? Jay, can I, can I respond to the text? Is it okay? And then finally, I want to end on this question of the diversity of human movement. And we all bring our own movement to our life. Change, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Stackowitz, it says. <laughs> Hi, dear. So, our own development, even as individual human beings, aren't a species-specific, generic concept. Our Umwelten are products of our culture, our historical legacy, the environments that we're in, everything. Whether you're blind, you're a member of the Nez Pierce tribe, you're on the Project Tech Type team, or you're members and students in the Scuba Diversity Program at Scripps. All of our experiences are different and all of our Umwelten are different. And who knows what Umwelten are missing from our understanding of the future of diversity in the sea. But one thing you can be pretty sure of is what you don't know you don't know is vastly greater than what you know, and vastly greater than what you know and you don't, what you know you don't know. <laughs> but if the past and present of marine science have anything to teach us, there's a lot out there that we don't know, and we don't know what it is. So some final, almost final, deep thoughts about this thing in our own Socrates said, you don't know what you don't know. And my Socrates, um, who self-identified with the uh, fake philosopher named Plumbius, Bob uh, Newberry, who's in Santa Cruz, his manifestation of that is the goal of an education is to become sure of what you don't know. Not to reinforce what you do know, but to become sure of what you don't know. And then Izzy and Don Abbott, who were the great grandparents of many, many of us in psychology and invertebrate zoology and understanding the diversity of the coast, west coast of North America and Hawaii, 
Their way of saying this is that observations are interpretation. They're products of our own mind and what we want to see in our preconceptions, in our cultures, in our histories, our genders, our sexual orientation, the whole thing. And then the other great piece of wisdom that they had to give is there's no substitute for fine forceps, none. <laughs> and it really took me until I'm the age that I am to realize that forceps were a metaphor for them, that they were instruments that translated one world into a world that we were better able to manipulate and sense and deal with. But forceps don't mean anything to Gary Vilnius. His hands mean everything to Gary Vilnius. And that's, I think, what is and Don will communicate when they say there's no such thing. There's no substitute for fine forces. And then finally, I want to leave us with just two minutes of fun. I hope this is okay. I'm sorry I'm not aware of it. I want to challenge you with a new um Dublin. I could find one talk that dealt with sound at the WSN meetings this year. It had to do with vocal communication, I believe. I can't remember whether the seal or sea lion pups and their mothers. But I want to challenge you with an idea, a new concept, maybe. Maybe it's Bible, maybe it's not. And it's sound in the sea, the new eDNA. And there's a really cool paper that came out last year called Exploring Coral Reef Biodiversity via Underwater Soundscapes. And so basically, by, I see, I can't think of the right word, sound coding, bar coding, whatever, what you hear on the reef, and then sampling a reef sound, can you characterize the biodiversity of the reef? Pretty cool idea, huh? I don't know what the answer is, but let's make this ad hominem and see if you can. So this is your Umwelten final exam. Ready? I'm going to play a sound, and you're going to tell me what it is. Last question. <laughs> How many people say earthquake? How many people say parrotfish? How many people say snapping fast? How many people say urchin herd? And how many people say cat barking? <laughs> I always thought, you know, when you have sounds that wake you up in the morning on your, on your iPhone, for those of you who've never heard a cat barking on the phone, that gets you out of bed really fast. The urchin herd people have. So that's it, you guys. Have a safe trip home. Um, expand your room belt as broadly as you can. Listen to your fellow human beings and all of their diversity because they will make you better scientists and help you understand more of the future of diversity in the city. Take care. Have a safe trip.